Well, everyone have a seat, and um, thank you all for coming. It's been a really stimulating day, and um, I, it's a wonderful thing to see uh, so much conversation going on, and it always happens at conferences that there's never enough time. Um, so we'll, we'll, th what, that's, what, that's one of the things that the uh, receptions are good for. So I do want to say that um, after this afternoon's keynote, um, there will be a reception at the library um, in connection with the exhibit, and there will be some people pointing you in the direction of the library if you don't know where it is. It's, it's just across the uh, uh, quad. It's not far at all. Um, so, and if you have any questions, there'll be other people around to ask. Um, and I also wanted to say that we're going to reconvene tomorrow at um, 10 o'clock in the morning uh, for uh, another panel, and I hope to see you all here then. There'll be some coffee and some rolls to start with before that, if that'll entice you to get up early. So um, now I want to introduce uh, Jim Searing, who we know from earlier uh, uh, panel, uh, and he will introduce Toy and Falola, our keynote speaker this afternoon. Thank you. Well, I should begin by saying that I'm I'm both honored and a bit intimidated uh, by the task of introducing uh, Dr. Toyin Falola to this audience. And when I was first asked by Sue whether I would do it, uh, one of the first things I thought of was how I was going to approach um, such, such a topic. And the first thought that occurred to me is I had to think, um, well, I've spent most of my time in West Africa and Senegal, so I had to think like a wall off. And so that immediately helped me out because I thought I would describe uh, Dr. Falola, as we would say in wall off, as a domu ibadan. In English, that would be a child of Ibadan, although it sounds better in Wolof because the emphasis on childhood is not really in the Wolof phrase. And so I think this is where I'd like to start. Um, Ibadan is a Yoruba city that was founded in the 1820s in a period of turmoil and war that began in the 1790s, at about the same moment when Freetown was founded. And Ibadan was at the center of the storm that engulfed Yoruba-speaking peoples in the 19th century. Hundreds of thousands crossed the Atlantic as slaves, while in the Yoruba homeland, the old order was largely destroyed by war, even as powerful new city-states emerged. Of these, the largest and the most powerful was Ibadan which became the largest city in West Africa in the 19th century, and it was the center of the largest uh, Yoruba state. In Ibadan, in this period, Atlantic and African history were two sides of the same coin. If we are pausing for a few minutes um, to think about Ibadan, one reason is that I would like to thank Professor Falola for writing a very moving book, A Mouth Sweeter Than Salt, an African memoir, which was published in 2004 and which was a finalist for the Hertzkowitz Prize in African Studies in 2004-2005. This book is beautifully written and written with humor, compassion, and grit. It tells the story of growing up in Ibadan a tough city, a city where words are important and where words often carry multiple meanings. Readers of the book get a delightful primer in Yoruba culture, history, and politics. Looking back on a time when the living memory of the past was deeply embedded in vernacular discourse and daily life. 
There, a boy named Toyin Afolola tells us about how he discovered many things and started on a path that would lead him later to complete a BA and then a PhD in 1981 at the University of Ife with a dissertation on the political economy of Ibadan from circa 1830 to 1900. Uh, that dissertation was published as a book um, in uh, 1984. Today, if one scans Professor Falola's enormous CV, his most recent book is entitled Ibadan, Foundation, Growth, and Change, 1830 to 1960, which was published in 2012. This tells us that Professor Falola, of course, has been working on Ibadan, but it also tells us that he returns uh, to the topics, revises them, incorporating new research, new ideas, and new methodologies. And I think, as we'll see, this tells us something important about him as a historian. After finishing, uh, well, I should say first, that the Nigerian Civil War, in a sense, ended this childhood story. Um, and uh, Professor Falola then went on to start his uh, academic career. He first taught high school, as many uh, African historians did. And then he served on the faculty of the University of Ife, later, later Obafemi Awolowo University, from 1977 to 1990. During his time uh, there, he received a number of important research grants from SSRC, Guggenheim, uh, NEH, York University, and other sources. And these uh, research grants supported the collection of vernacular texts and oral traditions, among other things, preparing the way for the public, many future publications on the Yoruba and I'll just name a few, and some of them come out uh, later, but they go back um, to this period. Uh, Yoruba Gurus, Ind Indigenous Production of Knowledge in Africa, published in 2000. Yoruba Warlords of the 19th Century, which he co-authored, which was published in 2001, and many more. And you're going to hear that phrase often, and many more. I'm going to name a lot of publications, but believe me, I'm not going to come close to naming all of them, not even close to naming all of the important ones. And here I think we should also think for a moment about how important these decades, that is, the 1970s through the 90s, were in the development of African history, especially in Nigeria. So this was a rich period. A lot was going on. Um, in uh, Nigerian universities, and Professor Falola was there uh, playing a part in these both heady and also somewhat dark decades in Nigeria's um, post-colonial history. Now I'd like to think about relocation. Relocation um, across the Atlantic. Professor Falola moved the base of his operations from Nigeria to North America um, in, uh, I think, 1990. He spent a year in York University in Canada before moving to the University of Texas in 1991, where he is currently the Francis Higginbotham Null Centennial Professor in History. I have to imagine that for a child of a Baden to make this journey, it went without saying that he would go on and accumulate titles and honors and make new conquests. Because as I said, Ibadan is a tough city and it has a certain ethos. While he had already published and edited many books in Nigeria, his time in North America has seen an explosion of these activities. I can really think of no one else in the, any field of history who has been as active in the profession as an author 
teacher, researcher, guest lecturer, and editor. And all of this activity has put him at the center of African history in the United States, where I would say he occupies a strategic position uh, and sees things, uh, more things, than in probably any other uh, contemporary African historian. He has been and is still occupied in the publication of books of all kinds, textbooks for a general audience, and he edits a series on cultures of Africa, academic histories, fest shrifts honoring the careers of other scholars, and there are many of those that he has edited over the years, and he has in turn uh, been honored with fest strips published uh, in his honor. And typically, you'll see that Toyin uh, Falola contributes um, an introduction or something to each of these publications. Many of these books come out of conferences like this one, and many are relevant to the topic of this symposium. And so now I will name just a selection of titles um, the Changing Worlds of Atlantic Africa, Essays in Honor of Robin Law, which he co-edited, published in 2009. The Atlantic World, 1450 to 2000, also co-edited, published in 2008. The Archaeology of Africa and the African Diaspora, co-edited, uh, published in 2007. The Yoruba, Diaspora in the Atlantic World, co-edited, uh, published in 2004. Orisha, Yoruba Gods and Spiritual Identity in Africa, and the D Diaspora, uh, co-edited, published in 2005. And I could go on, but I think that gives you some idea. At the same time, he published numerous monographs including violence in Nigeria, the crisis of religious politics and secular ideologies, uh, which was published in 1998, Nationalism and African Intellectuals, which was published in 2001, and Colonialism and Violence in Nigeria, published in 2009. Again, um, just a selection. So finally, I'd like to conclude these brief remarks with a little bit of reflection. Um, it's easy to get lost in the forest. So I would like to offer at least some guidelines for anyone trying, say, to digest the contents of Professor Falola's 58-page curriculum vita. In doing so, I also am drawing again on some West African uh, ideas because I want to avoid getting involved in counting his achievements. In many parts of West Africa, counting human beings, counting some kinds of their possessions, um, not all, it's okay to count money, uh, and counting someone's achievements still often has somewhat sinister connotations. So I guess I'm off the hook. I won't count for you. I won't count books. And in fact, one time when I did introduce someone in Senegal and they thought I was doing too much counting, that is naming too many things, I was later told that this person, you know, an academic scholar, but who shared these ideas, was worried that I might be preparing his funeral oration. So. I can assure you that was not the case then, and it's certainly not the case today, and so I won't count everything. But I will uh, offer some concluding thoughts on how you might try to understand this output. Many of his works, including some that I've already mentioned, relate to what historians now typically called the production of knowledge. And I would say knowledge production and the history of African history are central to 
uh, Toy and Falola's work. That is, he thinks very carefully, and very passionately about these topics. So in some ways, he's an intellectual historian, but in a broad sense of this term. This started with his immersion in vernacular Yoruba texts and traditions, uh, oral, poetry, songs, proverbs, all that, uh, which was part of his childhood, of course, in Ibadan. Uh, but it also includes important work for African historians. And one thing Professor Filola does is re he reminds us over and over again about the history of African history. So I'd like to now, I'll mention some other titles, but um, I would say that this work is a work of, um, in some cases, he's honoring past achievements. Uh, he doesn't want us to forget the history work that was done uh, in Nigeria, say, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. But he also wants us to read it so we can continue to make innovations uh, in African history. And so some of the titles I'm thinking of are Sources and Methods in African History, Spoken, Written, Unearthed, a co-edited book published in 2003, a book, Ibo History and Society, the Essays of Adiello Afibo, uh, published in 2005. And here he has really edited the works of a Nigerian historian. There actually, there's another volume as well. So that it will be easy, easier, especially for many historians to read the essays of Adi Eli Afigbo and not forget the achievements of that generation. Another book of this kind is Africa in the 20th Century, the Aru Boahan Reader, uh, published in 2004. And also, uh, Professor Toyo has edited an important book uh, on the women's Women's War of 1929, a history of anti-colonial resistance in Eastern, Eastern Nigeria. And there he co-authored a sub, sort of a short book as an introduction to this. But this is really a major publication of primary sources about an important historical event. In other words, this is a resource that professors could ask their students to use uh, to write research papers. In other words, most of the book um, is the publication of important primary sources about the women's war of the Eastern region in 1929. All of these works and many others, remember, uh, I, can't, I can't bound this stream, I can't count, and I can't name all the titles. All of these attest to Professor Fofola's in, enduring interest in historiography, the sources of history, and methodology. In sum, he is creating, uh, you know, he's preserving works from the past, and in others, he is writing history and making available primary sources uh, for an audience. And of course, to state the obvious, Professor Falola has made an enormous contribution to the history of the Yoruba, the history of West Africa, and the history of Nigeria since uh, the 19th century. So, well, I'd just like to end by, by quoting a proverb um, known to both the Yoruba and the Wala, that is that no matter how long a piece of wood remains in the water, it will not turn into a crocodile. And so, not being a crocodile, I give you toy and falala. I just want to say that I did not pay for that um, introduction. He did it voluntarily, and he carries his own risk. Thank you. Uh, I do not know whether what we put in place will work in terms of the ability to see this. If it doesn't work, we just demolish it, and then I just, um, can you see it at the back? 
If you can't say, then we just forget about it uh, so that you don't get distracted. The reason why we wanted to use it is because some people think um, I'm not speaking in English, uh, which I can understand because of the way we pronounce different words. Uh, in some places in Africa, they pronounce the L as R. So when they were jubilating, uh, when Obama won that ele uh, ele election, I was in a place where they were saying, Obama had an erection. He had an erection instead of saying <laughs> They said, well, I hope Michelle wouldn't hear this. <laughs> I want to turn this off, if you don't mind, because it's not going to work. How do we turn it off if it's not going to work? Uh, thank you very much. We normally have to express gratitude to those who have brought us together. Susan, thank you very much. Linda, where are you? Thank you very much. James, thank you very much. We are very grateful. We have to thank on your behalf and because this is not going to work. So let's turn, if we turn it off, it won't create a uh, it won't. Um, I can close this, right? Yes. For those of you who cannot follow my accent, I apologize and. Um, when next I come back, I'm an Indian. I will reincarnate as one of you, and then <laughs> I will do better. Uh, we also have to thank the consulate for that wonderful reception. I was wondering why we couldn't do this keynote in that lovely place. So I think next time you are doing this conference, there's a keynote space, right? <laughs> uh, we have to thank the library for the resources that is going to make available. Uh, after we disintegrate this panel, we're going to look at the resources and um, hopefully we'll bring um, more graduate students to benefit from them and it will serve as globalizing your university. And I think one of the things we should all do, those of us that you have invited, I think after we've seen the resources, we should write to the chancellor and the dean and tell them our honest opinion about what they have and the extent to which this university can contribute uh, to global connectivity and production in ways in which the name of the university gets enlarged. So thank you very much. All the great scholars, some have read their books. I've never met them. Like my friend from Colombia, I've used his book in my seminar, but I was seeing him for the first time. Thank you for coming. And um, I want to share a story with you. Uh, one of the achievements of this conference, yesterday when we were having the reception, I was talking to Christine. And as I was talking to, no, no, I was talking to Anna, and Christine came. Where is Anna? Uh, Anna? Yeah, Roosevelt and, and Christine, they were looking at one another. And they said, what? We know one another. And they did. They, they were freshmen, fresh women, in 1964. And the last time they saw was in 1970s. And yesterday, they reconnected. Thank you for bringing them together. <laughs> I want to crave your indulgence to ask um, one gentleman to please stand up and come forward. His name is Dick Simpson. Please, would you want to stand up? I would like to suggest that this conference be dedicated to him. Uh, many of you do not know him. He's one of those that we should keep celebrating. People who go to a, a place, do research, they take something, but they also give back. 
Our friend Dick has given back regular shipments of books to Sierra Leone. He has advised the Sierra Leonean government on how to reform local government institutions. We thank you. He has given money to Fura Bay College Library. We thank you and we salute you. Uh, we did not know that this would be his story when he did his PhD on local politics in Syria alone. Uh, we salute him. And I've also heard that he's one of the driving force in starting this Syria Lunian collection of real manuscripts on this campus. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wish I could say that is the end of my keynote. <laughs> I want to, before I go to my address, say one last point, that I collect manuscripts for like six publishing houses, including my own series. And we have um, a colleague, Anna now, not Anne, um, uh, Lucia, I hope you will talk about your new initiative, uh, but I can do that for you for now. She just started a new series on slavery, and um, I hope if you do not grab this conference papers, I will grab them before you do. Uh, so you have two opportunities. <laughs> you have two opportunities to publish this. Uh, uh, either in a series or in my own spirit, series. Speaking of slavery and its aftermath, it's like talking about a world without an end. One essay or book follows another, broadening the range of discussions, supplying new research, and engaging in new reinterpretations. Slavery as a theme has become the largest academic industry. The organizers of this conference have demonstrated good judgment by taking those aspects that define their uniqueness in relation to locally available resources that speak to their collection on abolition in Syria alone, the transatlantic slave trade, and Caribbean literature. Can you hear me at the back? The distinguished speakers have also focused on one or the other of these themes. We have listened to papers on fictions, the history of abolition and ethnicities and modernities in Syria alone, developments in the 19th century, such as. OK, great. Um, well, everyone have a seat. And um, thank you all for coming. It's been a really stimulating day, and um, I, it's a wonderful thing to see uh, so much conversation going on. And it always happens at conferences that there's never enough time. Um, so we'll, we'll, th what, that's, what, that's one of the things that the uh, receptions are good for. So I do want to say that um, after this afternoon's keynote, um, there will be a reception at the library um, in connection with the exhibit, and there will be some people pointing you in the direction of the library if you don't know where it is. It's, it's just across the uh, uh, quad. It's not far at all. Um, so, and if you have any questions, there'll be other people around to ask. Um, and I also wanted to say that we're going to reconvene tomorrow at um, 10 o'clock in the morning uh, for uh, another panel, and I hope to see you all here then. There'll be some coffee and some rolls to start with before that, if that'll entice you to get up early. So um, now I want to introduce uh, Jim Searing, who we know from earlier uh, uh, panel. Uh, and he will introduce Toyin Falola, our keynote speaker this afternoon. Thank you. Well, I should begin by saying that I'm oops, 
I'm both honored and a bit intimidated uh, by the task of introducing uh, Dr. Toyin Falola to this audience. And when I was first asked by Sue whether I would do it, uh, one of the first things I thought of was how I was going to approach um, such, such a topic. And the first thought that occurred to me is I had to think, um, well, I've spent most of my time in West Africa and Senegal, so I had to think like a wall off. And so that immediately helped me out because I thought I would describe uh, Dr. Falola, as we would say in Wolof, as a domu ibadan. In English, that would be a child of Ibadan, although it sounds better in Wolof because the emphasis on childhood is not really in the Wolof phrase. And so I think this is where I'd like to start. Um, Ibadan is a Yoruba city that was founded in the 1820s in a period of turmoil and war that began in the 1790s, at about the same moment when Freetown was founded. And Ibadan was at the center of the storm that engulfed Yoruba-speaking peoples in the 19th century. Hundreds of thousands crossed the Atlantic as slaves, while in the Yoruba homeland, the old order was largely destroyed by war, even as powerful new city-states emerged. Of these, the largest and the most powerful was Ibadan which became the largest city in West Africa in the 19th century, and it was the center of the largest uh, Yoruba state. In Ibadan, in this period, Atlantic and African history were two sides of the same coin. If we are pausing for a few minutes um, to think about Ibadan, one reason is that I would like to thank Professor Falola for writing a very moving book, A Mouth Sweeter Than Salt, an African memoir, which was published in 2004 and which was a finalist for the Hertzkowitz Prize in African Studies in 2004, 2005. This book is beautifully written and written with humor, compassion, and grit. It tells the story of growing up in a bottom a tough city, a city where words are important and where words often carry multiple meanings. Readers of the book get a delightful primer in Yoruba culture, history, and politics. Looking back on a time when the living memory of the past was deeply embedded in vernacular discourse and daily life. There, a boy named Toyin Afolola tells us about how he discovered many things and started on a path that would lead him later to complete a BA and then a PhD in 1981 at the University of Ife with a dissertation on the political economy of Ibadan from circa 1830 to 1900. Uh, that dissertation was published as a book um, in uh, 1984. Today, if one scans Professor Falola's enormous CV, his most recent book is entitled Ibadan, Foundation, Growth, and Change, 1830 to 1960, which was published in 2012. This tells us that Professor Falola, of course, has been working on Ibadan, but it also tells us that he returns uh, to the topics, revises them, incorporating new research, new ideas, and new methodologies. And I think, as we'll see, this tells us something important about him as a historian. After finishing, uh, well, I should say first, that the Nigerian Civil War, in a sense, ended this childhood story. Um, and uh, Professor Falola then went on to start his uh, academic career. He first taught high school, as many uh, African historians did. 
And then he served on the faculty of the University of Ife, later, later Obafemi Owolowo University from 1977 to 1990. During his time uh, there, he received a number of important research grants from SSRC, Guggenheim, uh, NEH, York University, and other sources. And these uh, research grants supported the collection of vernacular texts and oral traditions, among other things, preparing the way for the public, many future publications on the Yoruba. And I'll just name a few, and some of them come out. Uh, later, but they go back um, to this period. Uh, Yoruba Gurus, ind Indigenous Production of Knowledge in Africa, published in 2000. Yoruba Warlords of the 19th Century, which he co-authored, which was published in 2001, and many more. And you're going to hear that phrase often, and many more. I'm going to name a lot of publications, but believe me, I'm not going to come close to naming all of them, not even close to naming all of the important ones. And here I think we should also think for a moment about how important these decades, that is, the 1970s through the 90s, were in the development of African history, especially in Nigeria. So this was a rich period. A lot was going on um, in uh, Nigerian universities, and Professor Falola was there uh, playing a part in these both heady and also somewhat dark decades in Nigeria's um, post-colonial history. Now I'd like to think about relocation. Relocation um, across the Atlantic. Professor Falola moved the base of his operations from Nigeria to North America um, in uh, I think 1990. He spent a year in York University in Canada before moving to the University of Texas in 1991, where he is currently the Francis Higginbotham Null Centennial Professor in History. I have to imagine that for a child of Abaddon to make this journey, it went without saying that he would go on and accumulate titles and honors and make new conquests. Because as I said, Ibadan is a tough city, and it has a certain ethos. While he had already published and edited many books in Nigeria, his time in North America has seen an explosion of these activities. I can really think of no one else in the, any field of history who has been as active in the profession as an author, teacher, researcher, guest lecturer, and editor. And all of this activity has put him at the center of African history in the United States, where I would say he occupies a strategic position uh, and sees things, uh, more things, than probably any other uh, contemporary African historian. He has been and is still occupied in the publication of books of all kinds textbooks for a general audience, and he edits a series on cultures of Africa, academic histories, festschrifts honoring the careers of other scholars, and there are many of those that he has edited over the years, and he has in turn uh, been honored with festschrifts published uh, in his honor and typically, you'll see that uh, Dwayne Falola contributes um, an introduction or something to each of these publications. Many of these books come out of conferences like this one, and many are relevant to the topic of this symposium. And so now I will name just a selection of titles, um, The Changing Worlds of Atlantic Africa, Essays in Honor of Robin Law, which he co-edited, published in 2009. The Atlantic World, 1450 to 2000, also co-edited, published in 2008. The Archaeology of Africa and the African Diaspora, co-edited, uh, published 
in 2007. The Yorba Diaspora in the Atlantic World, co-edited, uh, published in 2004. Orisha, Yoruba Gods and Spiritual Identity in Africa, and the Di Diaspora, uh, co-edited, published in 2005. And I could go on, but I think that gives you some idea. At the same time, he published numerous monographs, including Violence in Nigeria, The Crisis of Religious Politics and Secular Ideologies, uh, which was published in 1998, Nationalism and African Intellectuals, which was published in 2001, and Colonialism and Violence in Nigeria, published in 2009. Again, um, just a selection. So finally, I'd like to conclude these brief remarks with a little bit of a reflection. Um, it's easy to get lost in the forest. So I would like to offer at least some guidelines for anyone trying, say, to digest the contents of Professor Falola's 58-page curriculum vita. In doing so, I also am drawing again on some West African uh, ideas because I want to avoid getting involved in counting his achievements. In many parts of West Africa, counting human beings, counting some kinds of their possessions, um, not all, it's okay to count money, uh, and counting someone's achievements still often has somewhat sinister connotations. So I guess I'm off the hook. I won't count for you. I won't count books. And in fact, one time when I did introduce someone in Senegal and they thought I was doing too much counting, that is naming too many things, I was later told that this person, you know, an academic scholar, but who shared these ideas, was worried that I might be preparing his funeral oration. So I can assure you that was not the case then, and it's certainly not the case today. And so I won't count everything. But I will uh, offer some concluding thoughts on how you might try to understand this output. Many of his works, including some that I've already mentioned, relate to what historians now typically call the production of knowledge. And I would say knowledge production and the history of African history are central to uh, Toy and Falola's work. That is, he thinks very carefully and very passionately about these topics. So in some ways, he's an intellectual historian, but in a broad sense of this term. This started with his immersion in vernacular Yoruba texts and traditions, uh, oral poetry, songs, proverbs, all that, uh, which was part of his childhood, of course, in Ibadan. Uh, but it also includes important work for African historians. And one thing Professor Filoda does is re he reminds us over and over again about the history of African history. So I'd like to now, I'll mention some other titles, but um, I would say that this work is a work of, um, in some cases, he's honoring past achievements. Uh, he doesn't want us to forget the history work that was done uh, in Nigeria, say, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. But he also wants us to read it so we can continue to make innovations uh, in African history. And so some of the titles I'm thinking of are Sources and Methods in African History, Spoken, Written, Unearthed, a co-edited book published in 2003, a book, Igbo History and Society, the essays of Adiello Afibo, uh, published in 2005, and here he is really 
edited the works of a Nigerian historian. There actually, there's another volume as well. So that it will be easy, easier, especially for many historians to read the essays of Adi Eli Afigbo and not forget the achievements of that generation. Another book of this kind is Africa in the 20th Century, the Aru Boahan Reader, uh, published in 2004. And also, uh, Professor Toyo has edited an important book uh, on the women's, women's War of 1929, a history of anti-colonial resistance in Eastern, Eastern Nigeria. And there he co-authored a sub, sort of a short book as an introduction to this. But this is really a major publication of primary sources about an important historical event. In other words, this is a resource that professors could ask their students to use uh, to write research papers. In other words, most of the book um, is the publication of important primary sources about the women's war of the Eastern region in 1929. All of these works and many others, remember, uh, I, can't, I can't bound this stream, I can't count, and I can't name all the titles. All of these attest to Professor Profola's in, enduring interest in historiography, the sources of history, and methodology. In some, he is creating, uh, you know, he's preserving works from the past. And in others, he is writing history and making available primary sources uh, for an audience. And of course, to state the obvious, Professor Falola has made an enormous contribution to the history of the Yoruba, the history of West Africa, and the history of Nigeria since uh, the 19th century. So, well, I'd just like to end by, by quoting a proverb um, known to both the Yoruba and the Walla, that is that no matter how long a piece of wood remains in the water, it will not turn into a crocodile. And so, not being a crocodile, I give you Toyan Falola. I just want to say that I did not pay for that um, introduction. <laughs> he did it voluntarily, and he carries his own risk. Thank you. Uh, I do not know whether what we put in place will work in terms of the ability to see this. If it doesn't work, we just demolish it, and then I just, um, can you see it at the back? If you can't say, then we just forget about it uh, so that we, we don't get distracted. The reason why we wanted to use it is because some people think um, I'm not speaking in English, uh, which I can understand because of the way we pronounce different words. Uh, in some places in Africa, they pronounce the L as R, so when they were jubilating, uh, when Obama won that ele uh, ele election, I was in a place where they were saying, Obama had an erection. He had an erection instead of saying that. <laughs> I said, well, I hope Michal wouldn't hear this. <laughs> I want to turn this off, if you don't mind, because it's not going to work. How do we turn it off? Maybe it's not going to work. Uh, Thank you very much. We normally have to express gratitude to those who have brought us together. Suzanne, thank you very much. Linda, where are you? Thank you very much. James, thank you very much. We are very grateful. We have to thank on your behalf. And because this is not going to work, so let's turn. If we turn it off, it won't create a uh, it won't um, I can close this, right? Yes. For those of you who cannot follow my accent, I apologize. And um, 
When next I come back, I'm an Indian. I will reincarnate as one of you, and then <laughs> I will do better. Uh, we also have to thank the consulate for that wonderful reception. I was wondering why we couldn't do this keynote in that lovely place. So I think next time we are doing this conference, there's a keynote space, right? <laughs> uh, we have to thank the library for the resources that is going to make available. Uh, after we disintegrate this panel, we're going to look at the resources and um, hopefully we will bring um, more graduate students to benefit from them and it will serve as globalizing your university. And I think one of the things we should all do, those of us that you have invited, I think after we've seen the resources, we should write to the chancellor and the dean and tell them our honest opinion about what they have and the extent to which this university can contribute uh, to global connectivity and production in ways in which the name of the university gets enlarged. So thank you very much. All the great scholars, some have read their books. I've never met them. Like my friend from Colombia, I've used his book in my seminar, but I was seeing him for the first time. Thank you for coming. And um, I want to share a story with you. Uh, one of the achievements of this conference, yesterday when we were having the reception, I was talking to Christine. And as I was talking to, no, no, I was talking to Anna, and Christine came. Where is Anna? Uh, Anna? Yeah, Roosevelt. And Christine, they were looking at one another. And they said, but we know one another. And they did. They, they were freshmen, fresh women, in 1964. And the last time they saw was in 1970s. And yesterday, they reconnected. Thank you for bringing them together. <laughs> I want to crave your indulgence to ask um, one gentleman to please stand up and come forward. His name is Dick Simpson. Please, would you want to stand up? I would like to suggest that this conference be dedicated to him. Uh, many of you do not know him is one of those that we should keep celebrating. People who go to a, a place, do research, they take something, but they also give back. Our friend Dick has given back regular shipments of books to Sierra Leone. He has advised the Sierra Leonean government on how to reform local government institutions. We thank you. He has given money to Fura Bay College Library, we thank you, and we salute you. Uh, we did not know that this would be his story when he did his PhD on local politics in Syria alone. Uh, we salute him. And I've also heard that he's one of the driving force in starting this Syria Lunian collection of rare manuscripts on this campus. Thank you very much, thank you. I wish I could say that is the end of my keynote. <laughs> I want to, before I go to my address, say one last point, that I collect manuscripts for like six publishing houses, including my own series. And we have um, a colleague, Anna now, not Anne, uh, Lucia, I hope you will talk about your new initiative, uh, but I can do that for you for now. She just started a new series on slavery, and um, I hope if you do not grab these conference papers, I will grab them before you do. 
Uh, so you have two opportunities. <laughs> you have two opportunities to publish this, uh, uh, either in a series or in my own spirit, series. Speaking of slavery and its aftermath is like talking about a world without an end. One essay or book follows another, broadening the range of discussions, supplying new research, and engaging in new reinterpretations. Slavery as a theme has become the largest academic industry. The organizers of this conference have demonstrated good judgment by taking those aspects that define their uniqueness in relation to locally available resources that speak to their collection on abolition in Syria alone, the transatlantic slave trade, and Caribbean literature. Can you hear me at the back? The distinguished speakers have also focused on one or the other of these themes. We have listened to papers on fictions, the history of abolition and ethnicities and modernities in Syria alone, developments in the 19th century, such as the legitimate commerce that followed the end of the slave trade, migrations and movements within West Africa, and important issues in Caribbean and black Atlantic thought, which we are going to listen to tomorrow. The last panel of memory is going to connect everything in terms of the past of slavery and how we talk about it today. And we have started that discussion with the last panel. And we were all enjoying it, and I was praying that this keynote would be abolished. <laughs> Let me broaden the discussion presented here in three ways. First, the crucial clusters that we can create to study slavery and its aftermath in relation to the resources available in this university and others in relation to rethinking the subject more generally. Second, how the knowledge generated in the preceding point can impact the way we teach and connect with the politics of migration. And third, how the older diaspora created by the Atlantic slave trade is connected to transnationalists, that is, the diaspora of voluntary migrations, that is, my own generation. While I'm going to speak about A and B, I will speak more about C. That is, if you still remember what A, B, and C mean. Which is essentially connecting the past of slavery with the modernity and presence of contemporary transnationalists. That is, the aftermath in the long run, and also connecting voices on both sides of the Atlantic, voices that hardly speak to one another. Let me start with the first one, knowledge clusters on slavery and its aftermath. I want to point to five significant research areas in connection with slavery and its aftermath. There are more than five, and within each category is a long list of sub-themes for which space cannot permit any elaboration. The first is a set of ideas that revolve around the impact of the Atlantic slave trade on Africa. The issues and arguments are far from being settled, and they get reopened from time to time as to the precise nature on specific aspects, such as demography and on the larger picture, such as lingering underdevelopment tied to population loss. Data and ideologies tend to collide. And emotions complicate arguments on the balance sheet that treats human beings as basically economic objects. We have major statements on impact in works by Walter Rodney, David Eltis, John Totten, Paul Lovejoy, and Patrick Manning to mention but a few examples. No one has questioned the impact but the degree ranging from low to high, as in the debate between Thornton and Lovejoy. The mining of new quantitative data is throwing up a host of new ideas on the specific impact 
on specific locations, as in the findings in the collection by David Eltis and David Richardson. Both Eltis and Richardson have also provided an atlas on the, on the transatlantic slave trade with updated knowledge on various aspects of the subject, including those that David Nottrop has used in his short test to introduce the subject to undergraduate students. Why Africans were enslaved, the conditions that encouraged the sale of human beings, the Middle Passage, consequences for Africa, and the abolition of the trade. A corollary argument is that the loss of Africa became the gain of the West. In using his labor to build his formidable economy, the thread between the work of scholar politician Eric Williams and Joseph Inikori is consistent and strong. Inikori is compelling in asserting that the slave trade and expanding Atlantic commerce completed the process of England's industrial revolution between 1650 and 1850. There are studies on the political aftermath, as in the Pan-African movement, Pan-African leaders such as Marcus Garvey, various forms of the connections between African Americans and Africans, and African cultural survival and retentions in various forms and manifestations, most especially in religion. Arguments continue on the relationship between the transatlantic slavery and contemporary forms of slavery in relation to practices of labor use and ideologies of capitalism and the market. There's a body of work on domestic slavery in Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries. How the end of the Atlantic slave trade redirected the use of slaves within Africa for large-scale production for external markets. The transition between the transatlantic slave trade and domestic ones is made clearer by Christian Mann, and she's here with us, in her book, Slavery on the Bat of an African City. Studies on domestic slavery tend to hand with the abolition of slavery, a slow death, to use the words of Paul Lovejoy and Ogendon. The literature remains weak on the post-abolition experiences of slaves, especially the transitions to other forms of dependency and long-term connections with poverty. That's one topic for a graduate student who wants to pursue it. Outside of some of the key debates on impact are new bodies of work on various issues, which attest to the growing nature of the field and the vibrancy of interest. A few examples. A study of 17th century Portuguese Sephardic traders, now known as Jews of Port Portuguese African origins, who settled in Senegal's Petisi Cote. Biographies of slaves and slave descendants, cultural icons, these are new books in the last two years. Networks of relationships within the Atlantic world, everyday lives of slaves in relation to coping strategies, and slave Muslims and the linkage between Islam and resistance. Enormous suffering in the Middle Passage, as in the recent book by James Wolfing on how the British ship sunk through overboard, overboard one third of its cargo on November 29. 1781, an enduring place of African gods and goddesses, drums, and other musical instruments. On the Yoruba Orisha, to take a specific example, have embarked upon a detailed examination of specific ones with a focus on Shango, which has been published by Indiana, Eshu, which is forthcoming by Indiana, and Yemaja, which I've just completed for Sunni uh, Press that will come out next year. The idea is instead of talking more generally, we should take these gods and goddesses one at a time and study them uh, in detail. The discussion on religion and cultures has moved in many engaging directions, as in how African-derived religions globalize themselves in new settings as ideas move from one part of the diaspora to another. A recent work in this regard is by Paul Christopher Johnson, on Afro-Caribbean religion in New York City. The second cluster of ideas on slavery and its aftermath is on racism. There's a link from the beginning of shipment to work on plantations, to the definition of identities, to the relationship between color and nationalism. 
There are studies such as those by Douglas Chambers on the Igbo that have sliced Africa into ethnicities and slave societies and how even over time such groups have created the basis of heterogeneous formations within black groups and between them and white groups. Slave freedom narratives make race the center of analysis and they have provided points of elaborate narratives in many books. Race and black solidarity informed resistance and the rise of black radicalism almost everywhere. Berlin's question, who freed the slave, is the title of his book. As the title of his book underscores the role of race, a theme further pursued by Eric Forner, who looks at the longer term consequences of emancipation. Various studies by Peter Camejo, Stephen Hahn, and others underscore the crucial links between race and political struggles and race and leadership. Everywhere, the lingering impact of the Atlantic slave trade connects with racism as the edited work of Maria Fernando Diaz tries to show, and as cases in such countries as Cuba and Brazil, in spite of denial to the contrary, also demonstrate, describing the landmark study of Edward Tillis. Long-term consequences in relation to access to power and capital, and the overall success of individuals have been connected to slavery and racism, as in the work of Leon Litwock and Peter Daniel, there are studies that assert with confidence that poverty in black populations in the United States has connection with racism. Cases of modern day violent uprisings in Europe have been linked to aspects of the slave trade and colonial encounters. Just as Europeans have contributed to African modernity, so too have the enslaved contributed to European modernity, as two major studies by Christopher Miller and the more recent book by Simon Gikandi have linked slavery to race, culture, and modernity. Race relations in the case of Africa are seen in discussions on Syria alone and Liberia, where ethnicities and conflicts become connected to the Back to Africa movement of the 19th century, and how the role of African Americans in Africa created a new identity that unleashed its own consequences. Alan Hoffman's Mississippi in Africa demonstrates the connections between migration to Africa and contemporary politics in an engaging manner. The third cluster is the most recent and rapidly growing body of scholarship on slavery, memory, and memorialization. A number focus on slavery practices and how they affect politics over time as in Marcus Woods, The Horrible Gift of Freedom. Some works deal with reparations and how equality can be attained, as in works on historical injustices. Memory has become an industry of its own, with many essays and books, just as, such as the recent ones by Alan Rice, Catherine Riant, John Oldfield, Elizabeth Wallace, Anna Lucia Araujo is here with us, and Peter Brost, who has just done a major work on Oshubo. There are studies of objects, places and thoughts as part of the increasing focus on heritage and memorialization, as in the most recent work by Edmund Abaka of the University of Miami. Comparative works on the experiences of slavery are few and far between. And that's one new suggestion for those of you who want to pursue this. Part of the discussion on the aftermath should include this comparative experience in different locations sometimes comparing and contrasting oral text with written narratives, the kind of attempt that the keynote speaker was talking about yesterday. The fourth is a series of essays and books that are we categorized under post-traumatic slave syndrome, post-traumatic slave syndrome and its effects. The connections between slavery and racism and identity are pretty well established. Even studies on aesthetics have demonstrated that connection, such as Banks' Hair Matters and Hair Story by Bird and Tops. Beyond Hair is the larger politics of the skin, and the chair of the last panel was referencing the relationship between body, race, and slavery. Discussions of how whitening is connected to distancing from the color black 
and a former professor here, Pierre uh, Jemima, did a PhD on that, and what the toned or bleached body represents. There are profound consequences that affect minds and behavior, as various works have entered at, suggested, or explored. Connecting chains and images, to borrow the words of Akbar, there are psychological damages and profound mental wounds. Roy Heyman and Leary have pointed to issues of trauma. There are responses to how the race is labeled, how race and slavery affect interpersonal and intergroup relations, and how they connect with violence, rage, and suicide. A number of therapy books have taken slavery and racism as their foundation. The literature on slavery and racism and post-traumatic slave syndrome connects to a practical activist project, the demand for reparations. There's also the extension to the realm of an activist intellectual engagement of Afrocentricity, which intends to reclaim the glory of Africa lost to its encounters with the outside world. The fifth set of literature, if you're still following what I'm trying to do, is on contemporary African migrants, the transnationalists. Immigrant communities can be found in all major American cities. This literature is the new frontier. As we begin to undertake more research and teach about migrants, the connecting points with the Atlantic slave trade will become clearer. A new body of literature is imagined on them in various aspects. Motivations for migrations, connections to older African diaspora, identities in relation to established notions of race, and contemporary forms of slavery in association with current migrations. I have generated four edited books on this topic, and there are other works, such as those by Paul Stroller and West African traders in New York, and the more recent book by Usma Oman Kani on the Senegalese immigrants also in New York. These five clusters point to established and growing narratives, as well as how the discipline will move forward in years to come. However, I want to elaborate on just one aspect, which is the connection between the older diaspora and the modern day transnationalists. In other words, I want to talk about the aftermath in terms of its modernity and in terms of current migrations. How do we connect Africa with its diaspora and connect the diaspora with Africa? So I want to complicate the motivations for writing about the African diaspora by linking two historical eras separated in time in order to suggest ways to integrate African and African diaspora histories and communities. Two bodies of knowledge that are treated in this, as distinct and separate will be connected on the basis of themes around the notion of a diaspora connected with Africa. There are those who regard the study of the African diaspora as a political project, an attempt to use knowledge for the purposes of uniting Africa with the black people scattered in Asia Europe and the Americas. From this perspective, the dominant issues relate to the marginalization of black people and the need to overcome it. Marcus Gave and Kwame Nkrumah fall into this category. To these two and others, Africa has a relevance to the African diaspora, and the African diaspora has a relevance to Africa. They are twins, and the knowledge about them can be integrated to achieve political purposes such as dismantling the colonial powers in Africa and attaining racial equality in the Americas. But there are those who look at this subject strictly from an academic point of view. To some of this category of scholars, teaching diaspora history is similar to teaching world history, with the underlying assumption that Western civilization should not be the only or dominant point of interest. Among this second category are those who believe that an insertion of Africa and the slave trade into the long narrative of world history is enough.
a sort of intellectual tokenism. Without being dismissive of this approach, it can be argued that diaspora history should not be equated with world history, and world history should not be limited to teaching about the diaspora. And there are those who frame the connections in the context of the Black Atlantic, following the lead of Paul Gilroy, or as Atlantic history, or a combination of the African diaspora and the Atlantic world. I want to combine the aforementioned approaches and suggest additional ways to bring together various issues and themes to connect Africa with its diaspora in the production of knowledge. An integration will suggest that what we characterize as a diaspora cannot be limited to one event or an episode, as in that of slavery, to ties created by the transatlantic slave trade, or to a time in the past. We deal with movements in various eras up until today, the creation and continuity of cultures, the survival and repackaging of traditions to meet new challenges, the creation of identities that do not respect boundaries, the linkages between power and representation, and the sources of conflict and cooperation between and within diasporic identities. The multi-dimensional focus should include the following, an understanding of how displaced people think about a homeland, reference origin, how the connection to a far removed place of origin are intellectualized and acted upon in practice, the formation of contemporary migrants into a transnationalist diaspora with one leg in Africa and the other one in their own society, and the deliberate creation of exchanges and suggestions on concrete actions by diasporic communities to talk about self and the other. Other races, such as, for example, the projects of the African side to connect the continent with its diaspora. Today, the African Union has created a sixth region known as the African diaspora. The discussion recognizes two distinctive clusters, the diaspora created by the slave trade, as in Afro-Brazilian or African-Americans, and those that belong to the more recent voluntary migrations, the transnationalist diaspora. The starting point is, of course, slavery. And in, uh, I want to summarize this part of the lecture just to save time. That we have to rethink how we also study slavery in Africa. When my generation was in school, it was not a topic that received a lot of focus. And we have to begin to look at the subject on the African side uh, more carefully and with greater intensity than we have done before now. We have to begin to compare experiences and conditions, and we have to begin to admit that during the 19th century, some practices were as brutal as in the American plantations. And we also have to study slavery in a comparative perspective. I want to suggest that we need a book on how the transatlantic slave trade has transformed the practice of slavery in Africa itself and how what we define by tradition has been conditioned by the Atlantic slave trade. For instance, if you say that Africans are engaged in polygamy, one man, three wives, we may argue that that may even have been a function of this trade in terms of how it altered demographic imbalance over time. There are issues around sources the data that we use that speak to slavery and the transatlantic economies, mainly in written forms, have been generated by outsiders. The records were created and stationed outside of Africa. In the critical 15th through 19th centuries, when the Atlantic economies flourished, African nations lacked the facilities to record and keep written documentation. To revisit slavery, it is important to evaluate Africa-based sources where they are available. To understand what is picked to in terms of slavery as an institution, 
and to understand how the conclusions from such an analysis can be set within an Atlantic framework. Current works on the Atlantic world, as good as they are, are creating for us new challenges. We now begin to risk distraction, which may marginalize the African interland, or the difficulty of managing large historical regions, which may suppress local data of value. And you find many works now forcing themselves into the Atlantic paradigm and how those works will have influenced what we call local history is going to be uh, a challenge that we all have to address. There's a section on the politics of location, on how location affects the way we study this subject. There are is, I've discussed sections of migrations and homeland as transnationalist projects. Why are Africans living? And for those of you who are interested in this topic, given this amount of data that we're beginning to acquire on this subject, the number of contemporary migrants in the West uh, is getting close to the number that were taken during the slave trade, if you put it at 30 million. If they are living, how should we define the concept of the homeland? Are contemporary migrants creating a diaspora different from that of the diaspora of slavery? And you will begin to see the tension that I imagine between these various diasporas. There are contemporary transnationalists in major parts of the world today. In the US, you find clusters in Chicago, Baltimore, Houston, Dallas, uh, and a few other places, and how this is defining notions of citizenship, notions of interactions between contemporary tra transnationalists and members of the older diaspora, competition, the allegation that Africans are being used as foil, and a number of uh, how to count in various places of works, including universities, the number of blacks that are represented, and how to count even the number of black students on campuses when you throw in uh, contemporary migrants. Some of the challenges of the present sometimes duplicate those of the challenges of the past, in which contemporary transnationalists also frame engagement in American society in terms of notions of race and marginalization, just as previous members of the African diaspora of, of slavery have framed that politics. The role of Islam is crucial. I'm skipping many aspects of this lecture. And we're in Chicago, where the nation of Islam is located, and how, whether we like it or not, uh, Islam, in terms of nationalism, connection to September 11, will remain a major issue. Uh, and how that framing of Islam will ultimately be connected to the topic that we are dealing with today. It's a topic that is difficult to confront. I've tried to confront it, but I will be skipping that aspect of the lecture. Let me now begin to move to the conclusion before I get into trouble. If I don't let you go and drink your wine, I'm going to risk alienation and rebellion may follow. <laughs> I went to the back of that, uh, the back of the screen thinking there's another door. So what I wanted to do after he introduced me is he will expect me to come out, but I will have escaped. 
I never knew that there was a plantation that was set up there that would not allow me to run away. <laughs> I, I had an English teacher when they, when they were, in, in those days, we, British system did not follow the, they didn't follow the multiple professorship that we have in the U.S. They, once somebody is a professor, that's it. In a department, you can only have one professor. The next person will be a reader. And so for, if you want to be a professor, you either, you have to find a way to kill the one who is already a professor. <laughs> There are many books on that in on England. Somebody made fame. So and then but when, when they make you a professor, you have to give an inaugural lecture. That's they call it you have to announce your chair. So this professor, if I mention him, you will know him. He said, I'm going to give my inaugural. I'm going to give my inaugural. They give me a date. Well, I'm still working on it. Eventually it chose a date. And we all gathered to listen to the inaugural. He did not show up. <laughs> Where was he? The next day he called, I'm now in England. <laughs> I have nothing new to say. <laughs> so let me conclude. We face a crossroads and new paths. The global economy is interlocked, and Africa and the diaspora are very much embedded in it. We want to be active within this global economy, not as suppliers of slaves and labor, producers of cash crops, domestic servants, or other exploitable categories, but rather as creators, inventors, managers, leaders, and entrepreneurs in control of the economic forces that shape our lives. The integration of Africa with its diaspora in knowledge production and policies has to reinforce ideas of empowerment within the global economy. I'm trying to propose the practical and academic integration of Africa with its diaspora so that ideas, goods, and people can freely circulate for the upliftment of all of us so that we can move to the center of world history. In this integration, the message is not that of the abusive use of forces of globalization in the service of domination or the never-ending penetration of global capitalism. I'm advocating the merger of dislocated geographical units so that ideas can spread with frequency to pollinate any degrading part. The continent and its diaspora can disintegrate their boundaries to allow for culture and capital to circulate with ease and efficiency. Digital and cyberspaces will continue to mediate the relationships between Africa and its diaspora. We live in diasporic spaces, whether we like it or not, and these spaces are going to continue to expand. Many of us may be able to answer the question, where are you from? Normally I say I'm from my mother's womb, whenever anybody asks me that. But not all can answer in any definitive manner, given the boundaries they have traversed, the places they have lived, and the sources of the knowledge and ideas that shape their lives. Where do you come from? Can become an entry to an identity marker that is misleading. Even if the question can be answered, it is far more complicated to respond to, where are you going? Or where do you retire to? questions that people have asked me over and over again. The African and diaspora world are constantly being reimagined. The dream of returning to Africa has to be balanced with the historical reality of its difficulty. The walls of cyberspaces and technospheres are linked to the world economy, politics, and popular culture. Forging zones of interactions, between African and its diaspora on the one hand, and within the diaspora is a necessity at various levels. The strengthening of transcontinental political views that have been shared for over 100 years, the advancement of practical projects such as academic exchanges and the training of a new generation of youth in various fields, the generation of new knowledge on cross-cutting issues, 
and the organization of conferences as this one to exchange ideas and promote this new knowledge. The virtual community of the world war of the internet will definitely grow stronger and play an increasingly greater role in merging the boundaries of Africa with those of the African diaspora. It should be possible to fuse various interests, academic interests, practical ones, even at this conference, there are those who are here who have been promoting practical projects. I've run into people who are promoting Pan-African projects, reparation projects, all this can be fused. Scholars with an activist goal can keep examining the human side of the transatlantic slave trade, focusing on the long-term consequences of slavery, sexism, racism, and classism as they affect black people, as one of us has done in, the, in, the, in this panel, uh, in the morning session. Let me close by making four suggestions so that if you forget everything that I've said, you will remember these four suggestions. And I want to sp stop speaking Yoruba. I now want to speak in English. <laughs> I want to suggest that we pay attention to the study of kinship in African communities within the US, posing the question, how do people survive? In relation to what? In relation to cultural capital, cultural cognition. How is it that somebody can land in Houston from Lagos and survive? We have to study that in relation to longer questions of overcoming poverty and questions of tension between the new transnationalists and the older African community. Second, I want to suggest a different kind of study abroad. There is not enough to be encouraging study abroad to Africa, to Europe, but students should do study abroad within the United States. That there are communities within the US, the Senegalese community in New York, the Nigerian community in Houston, there's a street called Bissau Nest. They own all, almost half of it. That that kind of study abroad will introduce students to issues, many of which we have spoken about. If you think this is not important, remember the Jeremiah Wright episode in which many Americans confronted Pentecostalism and the mode of African worship for the first time, and they were shocked by it. Things that I've seen from the age of five that they were seeing for the first time. Todd, I want to suggest that instead of what we have in Africa, African Studies programs, Institute of African Studies, we should begin to be creating Institute of Western Studies. I think the understanding of the West is very limited in many African universities. And this is the time to broaden that understanding just because they need to understand far more deeply the forces of power and globalization. And finally, I want to suggest the Lawrence Hill and Alan Gilbert model, which is to link objective scholarship to practical policies to live in a better world so that we can eradicate slavery sexism, exploitation, so that we can all say never again. Please say so. Never again. Thank you very much. Yes. 
now it's, it's my turn to suffer because I have done that before. <laughs> uh, perhaps following your lead earlier when you suggested a need for a clarification of various categories, what is African, what is white, what is black, I probably also think that we need to, we normally, we speak about diaspora with a certain assumption that we all understand what it means. Um, whereas all diasporas arise from migrations, it is not all migrations that lead to so diaspora. Mm -hmm. There are migrations within Africa itself. There are migrations of people in Southern Africa mm -hmm. who consider themselves descendants of Zulu people mm -hmm. in other parts of Southern Africa, but who do not want to remember that history. Mm -hmm. There are migrations in West Africa of people from Ashanti region mm -hmm. who have moved to what is now uh, Ivory Coast who don't want to remember that history. So perhaps we also need, mm -hmm. and um, we talk about African diasporas but I've never heard anybody talk about English diasporas, whereas there are Irish diasporas. So when we talk about diaspora, what exactly? The women. OK. Well, thank you, sir, because you've also answered the question. Yeah. Um, one of the, and the public may not know this, one of the outcome of the fall of Mubarak is the loss of funding to a major project of which I'm a member, the Afro-Arab Summit. When Boutros Ghali was thrown out as a secretary of the UN after his first term, he was looking for a new thing to do and was able to convince UNESCO to let him fund this Afro-Arab summit. And he used his connection with the Mubarak government to pursue this initiative. And Mrs. Mubarak became not just the sponsor, but the financier. So what we did in that project over and over again which also connected to the human rights that we listened to, was to talk about an aspect of your question, the movement within Africa. 75% of people who move actually move within Africa, not outside of Africa. And the figure for North Africa, which was easier to collect because of the way they track it was almost two million people every year moving within North Africa itself. Palestinians moving to Libya and other places, Egyptians moving to Saudi Arabia. And we began to formulate a set of documents to protect those people. So if you wanted to leave Nigeria to go to Spain, and you wanted to go through Morocco, and you are caught, there's a lot of suffering that people don't talk about, in which they get you thrown into prison. And we began to pressure government to protect these people and give them dignity. This is a preface to your question. Those who study Africa, there have been people like Kopitov and said, look, this is just a continent about movements, about two migrations, and so many migrations, the way you framed it. So one is aware of that. The other is the various um, layers and layers and layers and layers with representation say in the United States, part of the aftermath, I'm trying to relate the answer to the conference theme, part of this aftermath, which is the various layers of um, black people in the West, some connected to the diaspora of slavery, some to that of colonization, 
some to those of recent um, migration. And you see how these various layers have different historical roots, all aftermath of this great subject we are pursuing, but with different consequences and trajectory. Yes, not all migrations are diaspora. Are diaspora. It's, it's a term that was contested in the very beginning of its use, but which we have now come to accept and use uh, in relation to the Indian Ocean, the movement of Africans to this part of the world, uh, and um, contemporary migrations, which we now connect to this bigger project. Uh, but I'm aware of the contestation. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, sir. My name is Ade Tunji. I would like to ask some, um, the question I would like to ask, but the reason that's why I'm here, is um, you talked about um, Africans um, in diaspora, and then the transnationalists, and then the combination uh, of the connectivity of Africans in Africa through globalization and connectivity of people. But what steps or what steps should be taken or have been taken between connection between um, people that were here long time ago through slavery and then the modern day transnationalist. Because um, for the few years I've spent in the United States, I've seen that there's a huge division. There's a lack of understanding. There's a lot, lot of ignorance back and forth from both sides of the, um, would I say aisle, <coughs> or both sides of the um, Atlantic. You know, so what uh, has been done or what should be done to bridge this gap? Because if this gap is bridged together here, that would foster uh, the uh, connectivity of Africans in Africa and Africans in diaspora here. Thank you. That is part of um, what my lecture is about, and I, had to, I skip so many aspects of it. Bear in mind that this is not a new subject. We all celebrate Du Bois, one of the greatest intellectuals of the last century, for trying to create this bridge. You're familiar with his history. The era of um, connecting Du Bois with Nkrumah in the Pan-Africanist project uh, did not continue. In this fracture, I think I will put most of the blame more on African leaders than on African-American leaders. I know some of my colleagues will not be happy with me, but I think the politics of the flesh undermine what will have been one of the best projects in world history. I think that Given the resources that, and, and the new power they've got in the 1950s and 60s, I think they should have used those resources to advance the project of Du Bois. Unfortunately, rather than strengthening that connection, what they did instead was to promote parochial nationalist projects, which in the long run did not also work. Many of us have struggled to name a university after Du Bois, if only to revive this connection. In fact, um, uh, I traveled to the University of Nigeria and Suka like three times over that, <laughs> visited many places that we should just name this university after Du Bois. And it's very shameful that given all what he did on the African side, the compensation has not been enough. Uh, the lecture I was trying to end very carefully at some of the points you've made, and it's something that you and I have to work on. I think that 
you and I have to understand structures of societies, institutions of society, and how contemporary migrants, given their limited knowledge of a long history and structures, tend to make careless statements. That may be the starting point. And I also think that a new set of leadership must emerge, leadership that will borrow ideas from more mature people like Du Bois and use that to create a powerful network. Many may not know that the framing of Africa that we all teach who to how people like Du Bois framed Africa. When he wrote the book, Africa and the World, you know, the World and Africa, the very title, the way he constructs it, begins an intellectual definition of Africa that we hold to African Americans uh, a great deal, and how this framing has influenced many of what we do. And this is a time to pay back. Thank you. Do you permit me to ask a question? I'm not <laughs> Um, thank you so much. I enjoyed the talk, for sure. <clears throat> and, and I have so much to contribute, but I'm going to really um, truncate it to very few um, comments. Um, first, I wanted to react to the question posed by the gentleman on... Ade, Ade, Ade Tunji. No, no, not Ade. In any case, I'll speak to the issue itself. Um, he talked about migration within Africa, mm -hmm. and he talked about the Zulu, he talked about the Ivory Coast. Uh, another dimension to that also should be that uh, some of the so-called internal migration in the colonial and the immediate, uh, uh, in the post, in, in the colonial period in particular, some of these were forced migrations. And some of these were, um, they, they found themselves in situations where they could not influence their movement. The Ivory Coast Togo situation, for example, the Ivory Coast Ghana situation, the Ivory Coast Togo situation, it's very clear that when Europeans um, demarcated many of these boundaries, um, people found themselves um, in territories where they were naturally not going to belong. It happened in the case of Cameroon, Nigeria, where some people are in Cameroon, they consider themselves Nigerian. So this type of migration also was determined by the colonial project. And um, it, continue, it will continue to create tension and problems. Um, so we have to also note that migration, in as much as it was voluntary, in the colonial period also, the colonial project made it hard for people to locate themselves where they are originally from. Uh, the other point I want to make is, this one here, and I will talk about it over coffee, about the issue of uh, institutionalizing Western studies in Africa. I, I'm not going to pose a question because, as I said, you and I will talk about it more in detail later. But my, 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 my point is, I don't know whether we have to institutionalize Western studies anymore because uh, uh, the very fabric of uh, university education or Western education is framed around Westernism. And I tell my students most of the time that uh, I learned more about Africa in a sophisticated fashion when I came over to North America than I was in Africa. Before my, 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 my junior year, I knew more about European history than African history. So it, it, it's structured in a way that um, um, I feel that more should be done to increase knowledge, indigenous knowledge about, um, about history and also complement that with, um, with global history. Um, but again, as I said, we will talk about that more. The last thing I want to point out is the tension between African Americans and Africans. There's another dimension to that, which I always tell my students, the propaganda aspect of it. Usually what Africans are taught back home, in schools, in formal gatherings, and so on and so forth about African Americans, is negative. What African Americans learn about Africa is also negative about Africa. There are people who, you mention Africa, you know the kind of images that come to mind. 
So that kind of ignorance, that kind of in, um, misunderstanding is also part of the dynamic that has created this tension. People come to America already biased against certain group of people because of the kind of notions, the kind of things that we've heard, the kind of things that we read, and the kind of presentations made on their behalf. Whereas also in, Af in America, people also have notions of what the missions of Africans are once they come to Africa. So there's also that dynamic of propaganda that ha occurred well before this particular type of migration started. And it continues to, to undermine the relationship between the two groups. Thank you. Um, Mm -hmm. um, migrations that in a sense link our sense of understanding diaspora um, with other migrations. Mm -hmm. The English who, come, who came here in the, in the 1600s were very eager to forget about England because of the circumstances under which they left here. In that same way, the people who could be now considered descendants of the Zulu in the 17th century left Zululand under conditions that they didn't want to uh, remember while they moved to other parts, other parts of, uh, of the African continent. I think um, we have to charge for questions now. <laughs> and um, we have to have impose an higher rate on interventions. Uh, Anna, you know, hold on. Hundred dollars. Hold on. Uh, are you will? Are you willing to pay? I'm fundraising for the conference now. No, uh, I I really make a question because uh, of the issue of African studies again because I have to to, to raise the issue that you mentioned that uh, perhaps of creating uh, centers of African studies we should perhaps create centers of Western uh, studies in Africa. But uh, I raised the question of the new interest on African history that we have now in Brazil, then, uh, that is, there is a great need uh, to study African history in Brazil. There is a need even to have professionals. We don't have PhDs in African history in Brazil. To give you an idea, when I did my undergraduate studies in Brazil and my master's in Brazil, we did not have their African history. We did not take a course in African history because this it did not exist. And you cannot say that today it's emerging, but it is still uh, difficult. And I am asking, and the, the question is that, um, and this is now followed also by some migration from Africa to Brazil, a new migration then from Senegal, from Nigeria. And I would ask you if you think that the United States is still uh, a kind of promised land for Africans. Uh, or if other destinations like Brazil or even China, for example, um, what is the, the place of these possible other destinations for the African diaspora? Thank you. L let me ask the question before I forget. My, as you get older, you don't remember many things. So I uh, know that I want you to keep standing. But I'm getting senile, so I don't want to forget the questions. Uh, Brazil... Um, Thank you for the question. Um, I do many things uh, in my in my life, and I was part of the uh, part of the privilege I had was getting involved in in, in the Brazilian project of um, institutionalizing um, African studies, and um, I was. Um, one entire summer, I was based in Sao Paulo, running workshops for people who teach this program. I enjoyed myself so much, I came back and discovered diabetes, because they took good care of me and everything. Uh, I think that the suggestion on Western studies, do, it has to, it's not about a replacement. That's not the proposal. It's, it's about a compliment. And I think we moved from one extreme to another, one extreme of saying that colonial Africa marginalized African studies. And as we responded, 
and reorganize the syllabi, we move in the other direction. Uh, so I was in school, I read um, all the classics and Shakespeare and Hamlet and all of that, and they've thrown all those away. Uh, so the suggestion is to create a balance, not epistemological domination. I think epistemological domination, domination has become difficult with the number of intellectuals, but more of issues around understanding of forces that you inevitably have to deal with, issues of deconstructing those spaces, as in the question that Anna just asked me, uh, in which we have a generation that is unable to process Hollywood simply because there's no intellectual contest in place. Uh, I think that it is time to revisit many of this curricula and creating a balance. And it's also time to begin to talk not just about the West, but about China that we just spoke about. Uh, I will give you an example. Uh, I led a delegation to the governor of Benway State. They want to train many PhDs in engineering. And um, so the governor said he's putting money down to train 100 every year. And he said, um, he wants to send them to, half of them to my school. And I said, Governor, Your Excellency, that's how you can, you must start Excellency. I said, how many do you want back after the PhD? He said, all of them. I said, it's not going to be possible. I said, the people will come back are the, the dullest of them. I said, what? He said, that's, he said, if you train a top engineer in my school, and the student is very good, he's not coming, going back to Benway State. Because there are companies who are ready to grab him. So he said, what shall he do? I said, send them to China. <laughs> I said, do you mean? I said, yes. I said, second day, the Chinese government will throw them back at you. <laughs> and that's what we are doing now. Uh, so, and I think Brazil is also going to become a major force in terms of how we do South-South relations as Brazil emerges as, 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 as a global power. So the dynamics are shifting uh, in ways in which um, with creativity on the African side, with accountability, we're beginning to win the struggle for democracy, but we, are, we now have to begin to fight for accountability. Because democracy is useless if there's no accountability. I don't want to use the word corruption. Uh, you know, as you get older, you get more careful. Uh, so as we prevent more leakages, I think the dynamics will, will, will shift in terms of positive development. Uh, so. Um, my question is, I, I was just wondering about your thoughts and creolization, those movements and humanities, at least here in the United States, and even Caribbean literature. So that combines not only Africana, African American studies, but also um, Westernism, Europe, understanding Europe, but also understanding the way that people have um, repackaged identities of where they are. And then, secondly, I just wanted to ask your thoughts on. Um, about hybrid identities, like those of us like myself who have a transnationalist parent, but, and also an African-American parent, um, but who, and who often feel in the middle of these tensions between um, transnational bodies and African-American bodies and Caribbean bodies. Uh, those are my two questions. I endorse all your questions and proposal. That's very good. And, um, I will also say that um, uh, that is um, also the future of the world. 
It is the politics that we have to manage to reduce the tensions that would come with what you call hybridity is a process. Uh, I have um, three children. My son is getting married next year to a woman originally from Greece. My daughter is married to an American white, the other daughter African-American. In my own family, the number of black people is diminishing. <laughs> uh, I have a brother who lives in Chicago, married to an American. My bro two brothers in London married to white people. So when you see the Falala family, you do not know where they come from. So when I'm dead and my wife is dead, the lineage that I'm producing, right, they're not going to look like me. They will look like the guest speaker who spoke yesterday. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, uh, two announcements. One, tomorrow when we reconvene, we will be on the sixth floor of the north tower of this building. So it's the same building, but it's on the other side. And um, join us at the reception at the library. Thank you very much. <laughs>